I'm Sarah Pierce, the Development Officer for Scotland for the Heritage Trust Network. I take care of our, our members and our promotional work in Scotland. And I'm just going to introduce Kim Grant as well, our expert for today. Kim is a, a photographer who runs a business called Visualising Scotland and does training all over Scotland. So she's, she's the real expert. So here we are, Visions of Climate Heritage is a new competition that has been launched by Historic Environment Scotland um, with partners. So it's Heritage Trust Network, ourselves, and the Scottish Council on Archives. And it's, it's all around COP26, of course, it's all around climate change. Um, but the real focus here is, yes, it's a competition, but it's creating a crowdsourced exhibition. So that's the whole goal, is that um, the public can submit their photos, create an exhibition that actually reflects what people feel is important, images that they want to share. I just, um, oh, so it's, um, it's really an opportunity for you to have input into what Historic Environment Scotland is, is sharing with people. So there's three themes. The past was a different place. This is an emergency and a greener future. So any, anything that's submitted to this competition, um, either you can select which category that goes into or the people handling the competition at Historic Environment Scotland, they will put it into one of those categories that they think it fits best with. So just keep that in mind, we'll come back to it. Um, and all entries that either need to be photographs or artwork. And if it is a piece of art, then of course that does need to be photographed too in order to be submitted, um, but it won't be judged on the photography, it'll be judged on the quality of the art. So the competition categories and prizes, there's quite a few. Um, there's best photograph, that um, is, there's a higher prize for that one. So there's three prizes, the top one is 250 pounds. That's particularly to recognize um, that it might include professional photographers submissions. Um, so that's not to say that it isn't for those of us who are amateurs. Um, but it's just to recognize that it might be a, a higher quality of photograph, particularly if you've got the kit and the camera. Um, then there's the best mobile photograph, and that's recognizing the fact that a lot of us are taking lots of photos on our phones these days and producing some really good quality images. We've got best artwork, um, and that could be any type of artwork, really, um, apart from things like installation. So it's really mostly kind of 2D art that they're looking for so that it can be photographed and added to the exhibition. And then we've got all the young people categories. So particularly if you have a young person in your household or in your family or in your community, if you're looking at doing a community activity that might engage young people, it's really nice because it's broken down into these three categories so that um, it allows the young people to really shine within their age group. So we've got the under 12s, 12 to 15 and 16 to 17. They don't get cash prizes, they get vouchers. And I think it's things like um, it's for Etsy or it's national book tokens and there's something else, but those are the sorts of vouchers. So there's a good variety of things that they can, they can spend it on. Anyone who's under 18 is, is very welcome um, to submit an entry, but of course they do need the permission of the guardian and it will need to be the guardian's name and email address that's put in on the competition form. Um, and you need to just provide, be able to provide proof that the guardian um, has given consent if required, if they decide that they, they need that as well. Okay, this is the boring bit, terms and conditions. So I'll try not to go through it too quickly because I know that I can. I'm just gonna check the chat box and make sure. Lovely, everyone's saying hello, thank you very much. Okay, so if you're entering the competition, you need to be resident in Scotland, England, or Wales. Unfortunately, it's down to the legal side of things that you can't be from Northern Ireland or elsewhere in the world. Um, all photographs must be taken in Scotland. Um, so obviously anyone who's visited or been on holidays or anything and taken um, images or created artwork or anything, um, then that's totally okay. It just needs to have been done in Scotland, although not the artwork, the artwork needs to just show something that's clearly a Scottish connection. And as, as it says there, so the artwork can be paints, pastels, acrylics, pens, pencil, digital artworks, textile, sculpture, anything that can be photographed. I think they're just not including things like digital installations where it's all moving and interactive and you wouldn't be able to capture that. Um, 
in a photo because it needs to be photographed to be submitted. Um, so all the submit submissions are via the Historic Environment Scotland website, and I'll share the link later. Um, or I would just recommend Googling visions of climate change um, because it's not a it's not a short link. Um, all the submissions need to be in JPEG or PNG file, six megabytes maximum in size. And as I said earlier, it needs to fit in with one of their three themes. Um, you can have people in the images, but only if either you can't identify them or you absolutely have their permission. That's fairly standard. And you can put up to five images in per person. So um, particularly say if you were selecting from um, a range of photos that you already have from a trip or maybe just over the years um, of your heritage site, then you can put up to five. So that's quite nice. Um, and the judging, the images will be judged on their ability to tell a story as well as their visual interest, impact and relevance to the historic environment and climate change in Scotland. Um, so I think telling the story is really key, um, something that will speak to people, um, maybe make them think a bit about the climate change topic that we're all thinking about at the moment. That's what they're looking for. Um, you must be the sole author and owner of copyright in the entry that you put in. Um, but with the copyright, it remains with you as a person who um, enters the art into the competition. But HS is granted permission to use the image for five years. So that's the agreement. And it's when you enter in um, your piece, then there's a lot of terms and conditions there. And it spells it out really clearly um, that HS we're going to use this in the exhibition. They might use it in some of their publicity and on their social media. It's always going to be connected to this exhibition. Um, about climate change and you're giving them permission for up to five years, but it is still yours. And wherever it appears, it will be credited to you. So um, hopefully that's just a nice publicity opportunity, particularly if maybe this is an image of your heritage site or a heritage project that you're working on a community project, it should hopefully be some good publicity for you. And yes, competition is, it's a bit tight. So it was launched on the 6th of October and we've got until the end of November, 5 p.m. to enter it. But hopefully that still means there's a little bit of time if you wanted to do, say, an activity amongst your group or your organisation, a little bit of time to get something in, of course, because the submission um, is instant when you do it. So hopefully there's enough time. And all those terms and conditions, you will find them all um, on the Historic Environment Scotland website. They're all there, but those I just thought I'd kind of pick out the really key points. So these are our three themes. I actually quite like this picture that we've got that I'm using just here. And I think that's the sort of thing um, that maybe the judges are looking for, that it tells a bit of a story. It's maybe a historic kind of warehouse or vaults and it's people looking at it. It's what's happened to it now, how it's declined. It looks like it might be by a canal or some waterway. Um, those sorts of images, I think, are the kind of variety that they're looking for. And actually, if you do, if you do go on the website when I share the link, you'll see that a number of submissions, the submissions go up live instantly and there's already a range there. And actually the range is, is brilliant. Um, so it's really nice to see what others are, are putting in. And the idea is to have some variety. Um, so our three themes, the past was a different place. This is an emergency and a greener future. Ideas. So um, Historic Environment Scotland have outlined um, a number of different um, ideas and topics that you might want to include. But really, the idea is that, you know, sky's the limit. It's anything that um, interests you and appeals to you um, that you think represents the past, the present, the future, and how we're interacting with climate change. So with the photographs, it could be a historic family picture that just shows a different time when the norms were different, um, maybe something that we find unacceptable now, um, or something that's changed, but just something that's, that's interesting there. Remnants of former industry, of course, you know, we've got coal mines, fishing villages, that makes me think of, um, there's a photograph collection up at Wick Museum of all the kind of the fishing that went on in Wick. And um, it's amazing. It's amazing what was happening there and how different it is to now. So you can you can pull out things from archives and photograph that and maybe just photograph it that is and it because it tells a story or maybe put it in a new context. And um, there's lots you could do there. Maybe you could show our landscape, maybe in a previous better condition or maybe as it is now. 
Um, extreme weather, of course, is something that we're, we're battling with, with our buildings or the damage caused by it. Something that is being lost. Um, it's all rather sad, but then again, this is kind of the point, we need to highlight it and talk about it. Um, so I think, you know, there's already images up there of Scar Bray because it's right on the edge of the water. And we know that over the years, some of our incredible heritage sites are going to be lost unless we do something about it. Um, community power is one that I always think is good. So maybe an image that shows how you've been gathering people together or how people together doing something is, is making a change, maybe growing schemes um, or groups doing building maintenance or anything like that. Building reuse or retrofitting is always a good one um, and how young people are getting involved. I know there's already an image up of a, of a young, a little girl who is um, looking at traditional crafts and yeah, that's a that's a really quite a, a poignant one. With the artwork, I kind of feel like I shouldn't give you too many ideas because if you're an artist, you'll have your own ideas. Um, but anything really that inspires you around the environment, Scotland, heritage history, the future. Um, already up there, there's a couple of comic strips, which I just thought was a really good idea. Um, maybe some images of wildlife or some collages. Really anything, anything that takes you, and particularly if you're working with young people, um, then there's there's lots of different things that they can do. But I think, yeah, sky's the limit, really. So for those of you who are representing a group or an organisation opposed to an individual today, um, is there something that you could do to bring your community on board between now and the end of November? Um, could you promote this via Facebook and Twitter and just encourage people to look through their um, their holiday snaps or their literally just look through their phone of all the photos that they've taken in recent times um, and enter their own individual entry. Could you run something virtually or in person? As I said, um, we're going to send out the recording of this afterwards and particularly with Kim's top tips and advice that she's going to give on, on taking good photographs. I'm gonna cut that down so it's just a short recording on its own. You could even host your own virtual online get together play that for 10, 15 minutes, and then have a chat about it. Or maybe encourage people to go on a walking tour together, encourage kids to get together and do some art. Um, really lots of different options there, and hopefully there's just enough time to do that. And as I said before, this is hopefully quite a good project to promote your heritage site, the project that you're working on, um, and get it a bit more publicity. So that's, that's the kind of the real detail of the com competition, particularly the terms and conditions. Um, so I'll share those with you afterwards, but they are, they are all online on the website. Here's just a thank you to our, our funders who've helped us to do this today. We will come back to any questions shortly. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just hand over to Kim now, who really knows what she's talking about when it comes to photography. So over to you, Kim. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, it's lovely to be here today. As Sarah says, I'm a professional outdoor photographer. Um, I run photography workshops and retreats in mostly Murray Aberdeenshire and the Highlands. And uh, yeah, I'm here today to give you some, some tips. So I'm just going to share my presentation with you now. Just bear with me two seconds while I set this up. There we go. Um, so I, I'm kind of aware that I'll probably be speaking to a variety of, of people with different photography knowledge. So what I've sort of done is I've created this kind of 10 top tips to share with you all. The first two are, are quite basic tips, but they are things that people do tend to get wrong when they're quite new to photography. Um, but if you're you know, quite well known or quite um, you know, clued up with your photography, that they might be quite obvious to you. But the second half of this presentation will be the sort of advice that I'd give people to really make your images different uh, so that they do stand out. So without further ado, let's let's begin. Um, so as I say, this might be a little bit obvious to some people, but something that is so important and that some people do get wrong is that they need to really make sure that whatever you're photographing is in focus. So some of you will be entering this competition using your phones and some of you will be using um, more higher end cameras. And the thing is, if you're using a phone, generally speaking, if you're photographing something up close or a whole scene, your phone does tend to be pretty good at automatically focusing on your subject. 
and I'm sure you all know, but you know, most phones now with a touch screen, you can just touch on whatever part of the image you want to be in focus and it will automatically focus for you. So it's so important to ensure that whatever you're shooting, that the main subject of your image is in focus. And of course, if you're using a camera, this can also be done automatically, but you can also do it manually. And it's just, again, ensuring that once you've taken your image, just checking that it is in focus. And I've included these two shots here. These are obviously of, of wildlife and, and insects and um, to show you really how ensuring those more up close subjects there are in focus and the background there is blurred out. I'm sure most of the images people are going to be submitting for this competition will be more likely to be buildings and landscapes. But of course, especially for potentially the, the crisis um, aspect of, of this competition, you know, you might want to, to photograph some more up close subjects, um, you know, maybe things floating in the sea or, or that sort of thing. So it's just ensuring that, that your main subject there is in focus within your frame. The second thing is to ensure that your camera is still. I think when you look at focus, most people get that right. But one thing people do is that you sometimes see images can be a little bit blurred. So if you're photographing during the day, especially with your phone, you're probably going to be fine because there's going to be enough light coming into your, your camera and, and your phone there. But if you do find yourself shooting, you know, in the early hours of the morning or on a particularly dark day, or if you're maybe in a historic building, uh, you know, on, on the left hand side here, we've got a, the historic castle of, you know, Duffus Castle here. You know, if you're in a castle or an historic building and it's particularly dark, just ensure that you hold your, your phone or your camera still until the image is properly taken. Uh, one of the, the issues I often find is that there'll be a slight blur, which will soften your images if people haven't done this. So. Um, if you're using a camera, you can set the different settings and your shutter speed and whatnot to ensure that it's fast enough to give you nice crisp images. But it's always just something to be aware of. Hold your camera, your phone still until you're sure that your image is um, not blurred. And this is something that I think a lot of people tend to, to miss really when they're doing photography is, um, you know, light really when taking photographs is everything. And, um, you know, if you don't have light, there is no photograph there to be taken. So whatever you may be photographing for this competition, it's a really good idea to ensure that there's enough light on your subject matter. And you can see with these both these images here, you know, the one on the left was taken very early in the morning and you've got this lovely subtle light over the landscape there and also on the, the trees and, and the flowers in the foreground. And on, on the right hand side there, you've got Bofido Rock with the the light uh, hitting the rock itself. Uh, one thing I regularly see is that people will see a really interesting photograph, but the light is often on an object or the landscape behind the subject that's really interesting then. So if you are photographing particularly quite a large scene, so you know a whole building or wind turbines within the landscape itself, it can often be a good idea to ensure that whatever it is you're deciding to photograph has enough light on it to to photograph it well and um, otherwise you can find that your your attention is diverted to other parts of the image or the scene that you've shot rather than the subject itself so always look at where the light is how it's interacting with your subject matter and try and make the most of it when taking your images and this is more for if you're taking kind of bigger scenes. So, you know, again, if you're photographing something like wind turbines, renewable energy within the landscape, if you're photographing a storm coming in, you know, here on, on the right, we've got this stormy sea and clouds over the sea there. And, um, you know, just ensure that if you're taking these landscape shots where there is a horizon, that your horizon is straight. Um, it's just one of the kind of rules within kind of photography there. And um, if you've got a, a squint horizon, it doesn't make the image look as, as natural and it can look just not as, not as nice as if you've got that straight horizon. So always check before you submit any images to competitions that your horizons are straight, especially when you're, like I say, photographing bigger scenes with, with obvious nature and, and that within them. Make sure your story is clear, especially for a competition like this, you've got very set categories within it that you're being asked to create images around. So the best images I find when it comes to competitions are ones that have very clear stories around them. So with these images here that I've chosen to demonstrate this, the one on the left 
is obviously that the story here is the northern lights um, against the night sky and to give the, the viewer a little bit of context of where I am I've included um, some rocks and this uh, jagged rock here on the beach as almost foreground interest here to allow the, the viewer to see the northern lights within the scene but what I've done is ensured that I haven't included too much else in the photograph because the northern lights are the main subject matter here but just giving you that context. And then on the right hand side, the story of this image is this mirrored reflection of the sunrise and the clouds and the lighthouse there on the beach. So that, you know, they're very kind of simple shots. So you've not got anything else coming into the image to distract the, the viewer from the main story that you're trying to tell. So, you know, if you're photographing an old building, for instance, um, just ensure that there's not anything else creeping into your photograph. So you don't want any maybe distracting trees or weeds or foliage maybe creeping into the corners of your frame. Um, the photograph that Sarah had earlier of that old building with graffiti on it and the group of people standing there, you know, that was a very clear story. You had people very clearly being spoken to about the building and potentially what's going to be happening with it. And you could also see, you know, the context of the building itself, but there wasn't anything else creeping into the photograph to distract you from the main story of it. So always think before you, you take your image, what's captivating you here? What story are you trying to tell? And ensure that you eliminate anything from your photograph if you can, um, to that will distract from that story so that it's very clear. I often find when people are doing photography that you really want to try and create some mood within your images. Again, you're trying to tell stories for this competition and often mood can be created by um, the weather, for instance. So, um, you know, obviously if you're shooting like an ar archived photo or something, this won't, won't really um, resonate with that subject. But if you were going out to, to photograph something new and, you know, a building or, or again, the sort of renewable energy kind of thing going on there or a group of people, often it's about thinking about the weather and how that weather portrays the mood. So if you're trying to show devastation that's being caused by rising sea levels, for instance, you might want to go out on a day when there's, you know, maybe crashing waves going up against the shore to create that mood and that drama and that devastation. But equally, if you're trying to showcase an image of a brighter future, you might want to photograph in very sunny weather or on days that are quite changeable with a rainbow like you see here on the right hand side of the image. So I'm aware you've not got much time left to, to enter this competition, but if you are going to go out in the next few weeks, when you're photographing a subject, just think about what, am I, what category would this subject potentially go into and how can I use the, the weather to my advantage here to help um, portray that mood or that story within the images. And colour obviously is another great way to do this you know you can see on the photograph on on the left that the blue color gives you that mysterious sort of feel there and the mist um you know adds to that whereas the rainbow is much more vibrant and positive so you know color within your images can create that mood and help you tell the story the time of day can often be really important as well. Um, you know, you can get good photographs at any time of the day, you know, depending on what you're photographing. If you're just photographing a building on its own without any sky in the image, for instance, that can easily be done, you know, during the day on an overcast day, um, for instance. But again, if you're photographing a wider scene or um, you're wanting to create maybe more pleasing light within your, your images, it can be a very good idea to go out around the golden hours, as we call them in photography. So um, sort of an hour before or after sunrise and an hour before or after sunset, which can be very manageable at this time of year because the sunrise is, is very late now and the sunsets are very early. So you don't have to get up too early to do this or, or stay out into the evening. So you know, thinking about the time of day that you're taking your images can really impact the lights of them. And again, this will help with the mood of your photography and the images that you submit. And um, so it's always just something to, to think about if you want to really stand out, to be able to go out at these times of day when the light is more likely to be more pleasing. 
And within photography, there's a number of composition techniques people speak about. I'm not going to go into them in too much detail today. Um, you know, this is something that you can all go and look into if you'd like to. But there are things within photography that we regularly speak about. So one of these is the rule of thirds. And what that is, is that you divide your image into three lines. So you've almost got your image divided into three different um, components. So regularly when people take images, you'll see with both of these shots, if you look where the horizon is, it's pretty much on the top third of the image and then you've got two thirds below it. And this just creates a much more pleasing image. One thing that you find regularly people who maybe are quite new to photography will do is they'll place their horizon within the center of their frame, um, which doesn't make for a particularly pleasing image unless you're shooting something that is mirrored. So if you are photographing more of a grand scene, this is just something to consider. And if you're photographing people within a scene or objects um, and subject matters themselves, if you're photographing maybe a, an old building, try using things like pathways or this image here on the left, you can see there's um, this old defence is here along the coast to protect the, the village. It's, it's a leading line of these defences that lead through the image to, towards the, the, the village itself. And on the right hand side image, you've got these uh, wooden posts that are leading um, from the corner of the image through um, into the ocean. So, you know, if you're photographing uh, something like that, try using, like I say, paths, roads um, or other things within your image that create what we call leading lines and bring the whole image together and um, allow each element of your photograph to, to go, to move into each other. And changing your perspective, uh, this I think is quite important. You know, I think we all view the world from eye level. And in a lot of cases, photographing from eye level can be, you know, can make for very pleasing images. But if you're wanting to create, again, something a little bit different, I often encourage people to change the perspective that they're shooting from. So the image here on the left was taken um, high up on, on a cliff top. I'm not saying you should go and, and stand on a cliff top yourself, but getting high up. So whether you're up on a vantage point, um, up a few flights of stairs, looking out of a window, um, you know, maybe a, an historic building, for instance, um, or you're just maybe a few streets away and it's higher up, you know, getting that higher vantage point can give you a slightly different view to the sort of generic eye level that we all shoot from. And the one on the right was taken by me getting really close to the ground so that I could emphasize these rocks within the foreground of my image. So um, again, if you're photographing um, buildings and you want to show the scale of those buildings, or if you're photographing, again, something like renewable energy and you want to show the scale of, 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 the, of um, everything in the landscape, if you get down low, it allows you to, to create that. So just think about changing your perspective by changing where you're shooting from and the level that you're capturing your images from too. And uh, lastly, if you're really struggling with the more broader scenes um, within you know, this sort of competition, it's always good to look at the more smaller details around you. And uh, one thing I kind of find is, you know, if you go out looking for the bigger picture all the time, you don't always capture it. But if you start looking at the smaller elements of things, you can uncover photographic opportunities where you didn't think there was any. And um, so this image on the left was taken, literally just me walking on your generic path through a woodland. There wasn't much interest, but when I looked at the ground and I saw the, the pile of leaves that had fallen off the trees, you start seeing all these shapes and pat patterns which then tell a story. Um, you know, this could be done within this competition if you're photographing, you know, the devastation of something, if you're photographing maybe a building crumbling rather than photographing the whole building, you could photograph cracks within it, um, certain aspects of graffiti, that sort of things. Um, and then the, the image on, on the right there, rather than photographing the whole tree within the landscape, it's again about getting close to it or zooming into it and just capturing that small element of it there, you know, one half of the tree. And um, so, yeah, just if you are struggling with the, the bigger picture of things, you know, try looking at, at the smaller elements of what you're photographing. And especially if you're hosting an event at a specific venue or a specific location, you might not have the opportunities to photograph a, a number of subjects, but if everybody's photographing one building or one scene, 
you know, try and encourage them to, to look at the smaller aspects of it as well. Um, yeah, so that's all the tips that I, I have to share with you. And um, I think we're gonna do a, a little Q&A session now. Um, brilliant, thank you so much, Kim. Um, that was that was really helpful and you really clarified why my um, photos aren't that great and how to do better. So that's very helpful. I think, yeah, the points that really stuck out for me is particularly what you were saying at the end there about changing the perspective and smaller details. And I think um, particularly say if anyone wanted to take a group of people out or go out with a friend and do say a walk together and take some photos and think about doing competition entries for this, well, actually, if you're looking at different perspectives from each other or looking at different details, then you're not going to end up with the same photos entered into a competition. You're going to end up with quite a variety, even though you maybe took the same route and we're in the same place. And I think also, um, say, if you're looking at existing pictures of buildings that you've maybe got a collection of, um, well, actually, if you were to hone in on certain details of those images, um, then actually maybe you've got just a picture of a window that's declining um, or a gutter that's overflowing, something like that, then actually you may have a real variety, even though you've just got a wadge of pictures of the same, same building. So that's really good. And I think um, just to kick off the Q&A, the first question I wanted to ask was just whether you had any view on um, titles of photos, because one thing that I should have mentioned about the competition is that when you put in your competition entry, you can add a title. And of course, actually some of them say already, some of them on the website say untitled and others, um, the language it uses really helps to clarify the story it's telling. And I just wonder whether that's something you do with your images or, or any views on that. Yeah, I mean, I try and get quite creative with my titles. And I think, as you rightly say, including a title can be quite important because it really helps to clarify that story. So whatever you're photographing, just think about how did you feel about that when you were photographing it and why did you decide to shoot it for this competition and ensure that you include two, three or four words in the title. I wouldn't go any higher than that. Um, just a very quick snapshot of really the subject in the image, maybe how it made you feel or the colours or um, you know that kind of emotive element of it so that people are like oh yeah that's a, a broken window or a broken gutter but actually it's showcasing how sad it is to be losing that or, or the hope that we have of regenerating it so yeah a very short title with a few words but that helps with the story can be be really good. Brilliant thank you so Rebecca you were just saying about um, do the images have to be taken this year no not at all you could be digging through photos that you've taken last year, year before, or it could even be kind of archival images or historic family photos. It can be anything from any time, as long as it's, um, if it's a photo it has to be taken in Scotland, or if it's a piece of art, then it has to have a connection to Scotland. That's quite obvious. Um, so yeah, no time limits at all. Um, and that's what's quite nice is it's, it's bringing together kind of archives and histories as, as well as the future. So does anybody want to ask a question directly either of, of me or Kim? while we're here. You can always put it in the, the chat box or just unmute yourself and go for it. I think Kim, you've, you've given some really great top tips there. It's been very helpful. Um, and in fact, you know, I'll share in the chat box now the, um, the link to the website. You can see, you can see why I've suggested that um, you can just Google visions of climate heritage because it comes up a little bit more quickly. Um, and what I might just do um, is show you a couple of the examples while um, Ian is typing. Here we are. So let me just share my screen again. There we are. Um, so this is the, the past was a different place category. And you can just see, I'll just scroll slowly, you can just see, and actually this is where I think the titles um, really, really add something. So knee deep, scarred green bodies on the hillside there. Oh, for a drop of rain. That looks like it was maybe an old, is that kind of an old waterway or is it an old, or is it a dam in the distance it looks like? Um, this is a great one, Dalgetty Bay Radioactive Beach. 
So that's the thing you can sometimes use objects that do have writing in it to help you tell that that story as well. Ring of Brodger. Um, so yeah, you can see the sorts of things that people put in, and obviously the interior of a heritage building as well. Um, but I think we're going to end up with such a great, such a great exhibition. Um, that's going to be such a variety of different people's thoughts and ideas. Miner's Cottage with solar panels. I thought that was that was a really good one. That juxtaposition of the old fuels and the new. Um, and here's an example of a couple of the historic photographs that kind of show curling on a lock, which obviously um, was a major pastime in Scotland in the past, but now we don't have the weather to do it. Um, so that just gives an eye an idea. So let's um, let's come back to Ian's question. So Ian said, um, "Where do you stand, and where do competition judges stand these days? Stand on application of filters, etc., to photographs? Is an original photo sometimes preferred? What do you think on that, Kim?" Um, it depends what competition you're entering, but most competitions allow you to use filters. So if you're using a camera, for instance, so there's different types of filters, right? So if you're using a camera and you're physically putting filters on your images. So if you're using, you know, if people know you can get polarizing filters for your cameras that help you bring out the sky, help you to remove reflections. And you can get thing called neutral density filters that allow you to take longer exposures to flatten out water and the sky and stuff. Um, most competitions are completely fine with these. Um, but there's a lot of things, you know, if you're photographing for something like this, for instance, and um, you know, you're photographing an old building or whatnot, you don't really need these filters. Um, so it depends also on the story, I guess, that you're wanting to portray. If you're wanting to show the sky you know, really blue, for instance, and you might want to use a filter. But when it comes to like editing, which could potentially also be what you mean here, especially if you're using your phone, a lot of phones nowadays have these filters that you can put on your images after you've taken them. But generally speaking, they look really unnatural. So what a lot of competitions nowadays, they allow you to change certain things, like you can increase your contrast and your saturation and stuff a little bit when you're editing. But these sort of pre-made filters can often make your images look very unnatural. So I'd say to stay away from them. So it depends there on whether you're on about the filters that you screw into a camera or the sort of editing filters that you get pre-made on a phone, for instance. So um, yeah, try and stay away from those pre-made filters. But if you're on a better camera, then you can put the filters on them to help you enhance certain images of your photographs. <laughs> cool. And I think also, um, so Roseanne has asked about the limit of entry. So you can enter in five entries per person. So particularly if you're in um, a group of folk, you might want to compare what images you're putting in and make sure they're, they're different. But hopefully that's a good variety. And of course, I was thinking some of the filters can be really kind of extreme and wacky and al almost then it turns it into you know, an art piece opposed to a photograph. So, you know, if you wanted to go extreme with it, you could always try one out of your five and um, see what the judges think. Um, lovely, no problem, Roseanne. So that's pretty much all the information that we wanted to share with you today. And we just wanted to keep it nice, short and sweet. Um, and we'll send you, as I mentioned, we'll send you quite a lot of follow up information. So we'll send you this recording so that you've got this information to hand and you can share it with others. You're very welcome to do that. Kim is going to put together her top tips into a document and we'll send that out to you as well so that you've got them written down. I knew that and I still wrote them all down just thinking that's really relevant to me. That's really relevant to me. Um, so I will send those out. Um, yeah, lovely. And of course, we'll just keep keep sharing the, the website link with you as well. Any questions or anything at all that you come up with in the future or anything that you want to ask about this competition or want to put others in touch with us, um, do just give them my email address um, and I'll just share it here. Um, always welcome to get in touch. Very long email address. Sarah Pierce at heritagetrustnetwork.org.uk. There we are. Um, so you can reach out to me anytime. And um, shall we, Kim, do you want to share your website in the chat box as well so that people know where they can find you? We'll give you um, Kim's contact details as well in case you need her expertise in the future. I need a landscape photographer, particularly in the Murrayshire and Aberdeenshire area. Lovely. 
I imagine, yeah, I imagine you can, Catherine, I imagine you can um, submit photos by someone else providing that you have their permission for the copyright, because I think particularly, you know, if you've got, I mean, if you've got very old photographs and they're unlikely to have been taken by you, um, but I think as long as you've got permission, then you, you can submit it. Um, great. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for coming, everyone. Look at that. You're released 15 minutes early. You're welcome. Um, lovely to see you all. Thanks so much for coming and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.